Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Mark Randolph. I'm Dan Bova from Entrepreneur.com, and thanks so much for joining us once again to hear from the man, the legend, Mark Randolph, co-founder of Netflix, uh, original CEO of Netflix, and he's got some stories to tell about Netflix. He's also an angel investor. He has helped thousands of entrepreneurs like you uh, get their stuff together, get launched, and get going. Mark, how are you? I'm great, Dan. It's great to be back with you after a little bit of a break. Kind of looking forward to uh, answering questions again. And as you mentioned, it's a very special week uh, here in Netflix land. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll get that to a minute. Um, but you seem to be so happy to have had a long break from me. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, I just know that I need to be able to engage in the witty repartee that you were so famous for. I need to, yes, this need is to be true. fully rested and, uh, <laughs> and at, at the peak of my cognitive powers. Excellent. Excellent. Well, as everyone is already doing, this is awesome. Looks like we got a lively group today. Pop your questions to Mark in the chat. We'll get to as many as possible. We got a bunch already in the can, but first, Mark... Friday, big day. You want to tell everyone what Friday represents in the trajectory that is your career? Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting but bittersweet. Uh, on Friday, Netflix will be mailing out the very last DVDs in their DVD by mail service. And um, as some of you may know, and I know some of you have the slightest idea, uh, at the beginning, Netflix was not a streaming company. If you wanted a movie, we mailed it to you. It was a DVD rental by mail business. And more importantly, it was a DVD rental by mail business for nine years before we finally actually sh did the first streaming. Um, and so it's kind of amazing to me that Netflix DVD by mail has lasted 25 years. Uh, when we started, you know, Reed Hastings and I envisioned that the DVD by mail business, we, we could limp it along for five or six years, long enough to maybe give a jump start to the inevitable streaming service. But wow, something uh, resonated with people. And now that's uh, 25 years in, Netflix at its peak for the DVD business had 40 million subscribers, uh, 5 billion discs shipped. And uh, on Friday, they shipped the last of them. That, that is amazing. Now, you've talked a little bit uh, in previous episodes about, you know, starting the company and testing it out. Do you remember the first disc that went out? Uh, I do, as a matter of fact, Dan, because it was a big moment. I mean, I, one of the things we've talked about here is that starting a company back in 1997, 98, was very different than doing it now, especially for an e-commerce company. You know, now you just go over to Spotify, plunk down your $29.95, and you've got an amazingly fully functional e-commerce website. You're on Amazon Web Services, so it's all fully scalable. Well, back in the day, back then, you actually had to build everything yourself. You had to buy the servers and put them in a closet and wire them all up and air condition them, and you had to write every line of code and huh, exhausting even thinking about it. But it meant that when we finally got to the point where we had a site that was stable enough to take an order, process it, and ship the disc. It was a big moment. And that happened in March of 1997 when we actually shipped the very first disc. Uh, it was Casino. Oh, there's the packing slip uh, <laughs> to me. Back to me. And if you look up here, you can't quite, it's kind of a little hard to see, but in the upper right hand corner, it says order number 000001. Wow. That was it. First order. And what movie was it? It was Casino. <laughs> so kind of I look at, and I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there's, there's a logo in the upper, yeah, there's a logo on the upper right hand corner. That was the original Netflix logo. Wow. You, you can't tell it was in this beautiful purple color. That, <laughs> there it is. Wow, that's first, amazing. First order. And uh that, and then about a month, that was a month before launch, a month uh, in April 14th, 1998, we actually shipped the first 137 uh, customer orders. I don't know what the first disc was. Netflix uh, says it's Beetlejuice. Um, 
apocryphal, but a good story. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that. Now, when you made that first order, were you like running out to your mailbox every day, like please get here, please get here? <laughs> well, I think at that point, we, I mean, I mean, we didn't even have a final envelope. We didn't have everything. You know, we were a long. We, there was a reason we had another month worth of work to do. So I think that one may have, I mean, I was taking it home with me to tell you the truth. <laughs> That's incredible. So now I know, and we're going to get to everyone's questions, I swear, but just since this is such a big thing, um, you know, I know there's a, there's another, you've got another great story about uh, an interesting disc uh, that was just labeled President Clinton grand jury video. Now, I don't know the details of this, but I, I hear it's a, uh, an interesting story. You, you oh, there sure? it is. That's there awesome. Is. Right. Okay. <laughs> so this is back at the very beginning of um, the DVD era. You know, when Netflix launched, there was less than 400,000 DVD players sold. So our big challenge was how do you find people who actually have a DVD player? And one of the other big news items of that summer was that – President Bill Clinton was going to have to testify in front of a grand jury about his uh, the infamous blue dress episode, which this is a family show, so I won't go into what exactly that meant. But he was in some deep doo doo, and so. Um, but in an interest of having more transparency, they were going to broadcast the grand jury testimony live, and all the um, major uh, news outlets would get a feed. And Mitch Lowe, who was one of our uh, early people there, had this great idea that we should make a DVD of the testimony. And we could use that to try and like get some publicity. And we did this big push like, hey, if you want to get this testimony, we'll send you a DVD. Uh, it'll cost. It'll, we said we'd give it to you for free. But then at the last minute, realized that we could not um, process an order at no cost. So we changed it to it was going to cost two cents only because we had to charge something. And Mitch thought this would be a piece of cake, uh, that he'd be able to get it done overnight. We'd grab the feed when it came in. He'd process, work with a DVD manufacturer, um, to process it, press it, be all ready. And it took forever. It took four days of him day and night struggling. And at one point, Mitch um, called and said, I think we're almost there. We're running way behind. We've just about got it done. Um, but listen, we can. We need to do the label because the label is going to take us another 24 hours to press those onto the discs. And we all said, screw it. Forget the labels. Just take the blank discs. We'll package them up in the sleeves that you saw and we'll ship them out. And then Mitch came in the next morning, you know, pretty bleary eyed with a whole spindle of discs which we promptly mailed out, huge thing, kind of got us all kinds of press, exactly the things an early startup wants. Until the next day and the day later, we begin to get some curious emails from people who were saying, this isn't quite what I expected the DVD testimony to look like. And it turned out that one of the spindles that had gotten mixed in, and a spindle has about 200 DVDs on it, was of this Asian porn that was also one of the products that this DVD manufacturer was doing. And so we shipped out about 300 copies. And I, have, I of course, for research purposes, Dan, I assure you, went digging around and found and had someone mail one to me and watched it. And it was like, oh my God, I could do it. it I mean, it was pretty, it was really cringy awful. And we were going, wow. okay, damage control. And I quickly sent an email out to everybody and said, there's a good chance you may have gotten something you didn't anticipate that you got some porn. And if you send it back, we, of course, will promptly replace it with the right disc. And, and I don't know. No one <laughs> sent theirs back. <laughs> so, wow. Yet one more great story from the Netflix. Uh, that stable. is that is incredible. Wow, I I could talk to you for five hours about that, but we have to move on, Mark. We have yes, to sir. move on. We um, have some entrepreneurial questions to talk about and to answer. Right. Well, uh, so to kind of segue a little bit, this has nothing to do with porn, but um, let's see. Uh, so JC had asked. Um, 
Netflix is such a great name. Um, how did you come up with it? And what's your advice about the do's and don'ts of company naming? Oh, my God. So I'm going to do something very unhip for being on a show. Talk to someone who's invisible. Brad, you should throw up the one, if you can, that it's called Netflix naming. But I'll start the story anyway. So anyway, um, coming up with a name, as you said, is brutal. Uh, you have to um, f find something which is evocative of what you're doing. You've got to find something which doesn't look like you were spelled in a way. It doesn't look like you were drunk when you were playing Scrabble. You've <laughs> got to have it be something you can get the domain name for, something you can get a trademark on, something that doesn't mean something obscene in <laughs> Polish or Lithuanian or something. It's really hard. And this was no different. Um, and we had a whole bunch of names that we were playing with. We had done a brainstorming session. And in one column, we had uh, words that were evocative of movies. And in the second column, words that were evocative of the internet. And we began mixing and matching. And they were funky names. There was like, I remember, and a lot of them were taken, like flicks.com. Ooh, great name. Oh, taken. Yeah. Um, direct picks. Oh, oh crap, taken. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> this is the original piece of paper Wow, that I was using once we came up with our brainstorming list and I went back to my desk and began digging through to see which domain names were available. And flicks.com, oh, it's taken. Fast forward, uh, taken. Now shut, <laughs> oh, taken. And so it was wow. down to like three of them. We had net, we had direct picks, we had Netflix, we had Cinema Center and Cinema Direct. And Netflix, we kept coming back to. But back in 1997, 98, when this was, uh, a porno was called a skin flick. So <laughs> flicks. And so people were going like, is this a theme to this whole show today? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, and we were going like, oh, God, and that X does not help anything. Right. But, but, but everything else was bad. And so eventually <laughs> we're going, well, net, Netflix, it. It sounds a little porny, but I guess it's the best we can do. <laughs> and Netflix, it was. Uh, wow. And that's how we came up with the um, with the name um, Netflix. And there's one more quick story about naming, which is that, and this is more advice to everybody, coming up with a name these days is so hard that um, when you start, you use a beta name. Um, and that's the name you're going to use to incorporate. It's the name you're going to use to pay people to issue stock if you're, or, you know, do options if you're doing, uh, raising money. Um, and I got some great advice from uh, one of the guys on my board. He said, when you pick your beta name, pick a name that is so bad that when you inevitably get into the struggle that you can't figure out a name to use for your real company name, you're not tempted to use the beta name. And our beta name at Netflix was Kibble, like the dog food, kibble.com. Uh, and there was two reasons for that. One is I own the domain already. Um, but the other reason is that it was evocative of this marketing slogan. And I'm a marketing guy from ever, which says basically that no matter how good your marketing is, there you go, Kibble Incorporated, no matter how good your marketing is, if you, um, if the dogs don't eat the dog food, it doesn't make a difference. And so that was it. And you saw that stock certificate. That was the original stock certificate name for kibble.com, which there's your trivia. That was the original name for Netflix. Jeez. Wow. We're getting business. We're getting history. I feel like that, that sheet of the names, it's like looking at uh, John Lennon's handwritten lyrics to Imagine. It's like, it's so <laughs> wild. <laughs> it's so incredible. Yeah, there's some funny funny things here. Like, for example, on Flix.com, you can see it says, yes, it's taken, but notes, willing to deal. And <laughs> fastforward.com, available for $35,000. Wow. Well, but yeah. You know, Back then, $35,000 may as well have been $35 million right, in terms right. of whether we'd be willing to actually pay anything um, for a domain name. Had oh, I bought man. it now, I could have done something with it. Yeah, right. Seriously. Uh, wow, that's... Mark, you never disappoint, man. We got porn. We got advice. It's great. Um, so, uh, one of the questions that rolled in, I thought... Uh, I. 
jumped out at me after you were talking about uh, mailing out pornography. Um, what is the biggest mistake most CEOs make in the infant stages of a company? This is from uh, the name is not listed there. It's from LinkedIn uh, sent that in. Uh, there's, it's a, it's a, that's a long list yeah. <laughs> of <all the> mistakes <laughs> that, and, and I've made all of them. So there you go. Um, uh, so, um, let's pick two. One I dismiss of pretty quickly. One is, and it's an easy one is being undercapitalized. Um, the, obviously, you know, you, you, you have to, you need money to get started and don't take it the wrong way. Not much. But most people think that raising money will be easier than it actually is. And so they're not prepared for that. They don't leave themselves enough runway, et cetera. But that's pretty obvious. People talk about it all the time. I think the single biggest mistake that CEOs make is they do not adequately prioritize what they're working on. Uh, because the reality is in a startup, there's going to be a hundred things that are broken, more. And all of them are crying out for attention. And if you try and do all of them with the limited resources and the limited time and limited money, limited people you have, what you're going to end up is with a hundred things done, each 10% well. And it turns out that despite all the fact that these things are all crying out for attention, almost none of them are going to matter. Probably two or three things matter. And so if you have a limited amount of resources, time and money, you want to focus them on the two or three things that do matter. You don't want to do everything half well. You want to do those three things 200% well. And that is not easy because the things you need to do well, the things that are going to really make or break the business are not going to be obvious. In fact, they're not going to be the ones that are crying out the most loudly. They're not the ones that are on fire. And so it takes the skill set to recognize what they are and then the discipline to actually stay focused on them, even when the rest of the world is burning around you. And I see so many early stage CEOs make that mistake. It's such a common mistake that I jokingly call it selling the T-shirts which is they're all going, oh my gosh, just think of it. Once our brand is out there, how much money we can make selling merch. And they're already thinking about the merch. And I'm going, you are, okay, that's that's the kiss of death. It's the same thing when a big company buys a corporate jet. You go, they're taking their eye off the ball. Um, this is toast. Right, right. <laughs> focus, focus, focus. Focus. Uh, you know, that a uh, question that sort of taps into that focus a little bit is... Uh, this question this talks about a lack of focus or not really knowing what to do. This is from Craig uh, Lechia, which we got over uh, the uh, internet. Um, single mother of five uh, in college for business administration. Um, you know, she has a lot to say there, but basically she doesn't really know what to do. She knows she wants to be in business. She knows she wants to uh pursue something, start something, but she doesn't know what it is. Uh, any advice to help her or other people in this chat who are wondering, like, how do you find a good idea? Uh, and yeah, I think you said she was still in school or she's back. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Awesome. She said she was uh, in college for business administration. So I've talked about this a lot is that if you spent, there's no such thing as a good idea. There's no idea you're going to have on your walk or at night or wake up in the middle of the night where you go, oh my gosh, this is perfect. And it's obvious and it's right. It's not going to happen. And so I can feel your pain, going back to Bill Clinton here, that you're struggling going, I want something to work on that I know is going to be the thing, the big idea. It's not going to happen. What you have to do is just pick almost anything that interests you. Um, and you can winnow it down a little bit, but really stop thinking so much about it. And even more importantly for the stage you're at, what you need now is you need to start making all those mistakes that I just referred to as having made all of them in, my, in the last question. And the only way you're going to do that is by starting. And you're going to 
better to start with something which is the imperfect idea and let you make your mistakes on that one, especially since you're just going. I mean, I listen, mother of five, I know you don't have a lot of spare time, but do something simple and stupid at, in, at night wake, when the, before kids wake up or at school when you have a few spare moments. Build something or make something or test something. Sell something on the internet. Uh, make a little quick dumb product you can sell to other people at school. Do anything which begins giving you these basic building blocks of entrepreneurship, the stuff that you're not going to learn in class. We are learning ridiculous things like business plans and modeling and fine. Yeah, that's great. But get, do something real. And what will happen is I promise something will spark. Something you're doing will just all of a sudden intrigue you enough that you go, there's something there. And little by little, it will lead you. Netflix did not come because I go, oh, I can envision this 220 million subscriber, 150 billion, $200 billion market cap. No, never. It was just, this is kind of cool trying to figure out how to do DVD rental by mail. Every company that I've done has started off similarly. Some of them hit, some of them don't, but you cannot tell in advance. So stop thinking and just pick something and go with it. That's great. I love it. Um, here's a question for you, Mark. I often ask you questions, and I'm going to ask another one. Um, this is a I've heard very dis, uh, disparate uh, thoughts on this. The question comes from Leo Peng Maroki, who asks, "Do you need a business plan to start a business or to get funding?" I have heard people say you don't need one. I've heard people say you 100% need one. What does Mark Randolph say? Mine says you do not need one. In fact, not only do you not need one, I believe business plans are the single largest waste of time huh. in all of the business world. And the simple reason for that is that no business plan ever survives a collision with a real customer. Okay. It is one thing if you are a large multinational and you have offices all over the world and huge product lines and things are pretty predictable quarter to quarter, you're trying... Fine, do a business plan then. But for a startup to do a business plan is completely ridiculous. All that stuff you think and plan and design, the minute you start, it's all going to go up in the air. Don't think too much. Just same thing as the last person. Just start. Um, I should now that <laughs> I hate to do this. I actually think Brad back there has a picture of the executive summary of the Netflix business plan, which once again was a complete waste of time <laughs> because almost all the stuff that I said in this business plan we were going to do and how it was going to work never happened. As soon as we started, the whole thing collapsed. And in fact, in the plan, it said in uh, in a few months, we're going to have a collection of 70,000 different VHS tapes for rent, for for sale. And then shortly after, none of that ever happened. I don't know <laughs> why I wasted time thinking about it or designing it or planning it. You can tell this is, there we go. So I just got to call your attention to this, um, uh, the fourth paragraph from the bottom. In the spring of 98, Netflix will also offer for purchase a selection of approximately 70,000 VHS titles with VHS rental available in the fall of 1998. Well, bullshit. None of that ever happened. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. So listen, school of hard knocks. Someone said, you need a business plan. And I fell for it. Never <laughs> again. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, you seem pretty set on that. I don't think we're going to convince you otherwise. So we'll. No, no I'm not. Uh, I, listen, there's a plate. My other big principle of mine is rules are for fools. Uh, famous <laughs> words. And so. Maybe that I listen, you don't be the person who's going, but Mark, in this case, you've got to, yeah, fine, fine, fine. 99 <laughs> times out of a hundred, it's a waste of time. One time. Great. I'll give it to you. It's a wonderful thing. Have fun. Um, great. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> rules are for, is that your Dr. Seuss book? I mean, I think, I think you're on something there. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great name for a children's book, Dan. It actually is, um, Brad trademark that. The person who said that was a guy named Paul Petzold, who was the founder of Knowles, the National Outdoor Leadership School. And he was referring mostly to uh, leadership in the mountains, where if you say, oh, you always have to do it this way, 
it's how you get killed. Right. right. Rules are for fools. But it, I think it applies everywhere else too. So uh, here's a question that we got in uh, submitted earlier and something that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds, but uh, talking about debt. Um, about how, debt? Debt. How do you decide what level of debt is healthy? Now, I'm not sure if he means this in a personal finance way. Or I'm assuming it in a business way, but how do you calculate that? Is it calculatable? Uh it's a good question. Um, every form of investment you take uh, carries an obligation. Uh, and the obligation of debt is you've got to pay it back. <laughs> the obligation of equity is you have to provide some form of liquidity uh, and a premium at some point in the future. And both of those are genuine, real responsibilities. And like anything you do before you take on any obligation, you have to really understand the consequences and are you prepared to do what you need to do? Uh, I don't know. I don't use a formula for that, but at every time in your company's growth, some things are going to be dearer than others. And usually when you start, you what you've got is tons of equity and not very much um, cash. And... So if you can take in, raise money using equity at the beginning, I think that's far preferable because what that does is allow you to not have to pay it back. You don't need to take something that's going to be a scarce commodity and use that to pay your loan back. Uh, you don't ever need to pay it back. It's just equity. Whereas debt uh, does carry that. Uh, later on in your life, when all of a sudden you start successful, it's very easy to raise money. Yeah, then the debt's more precious, and then debt is a fantastic way to um, to finance um, a business. And there's all kinds of other subtleties, because some things you need money for are very short term or temporal. And a classic example would be the apparel business, which is very seasonal, and you have these long periods where you've got to buy your materials, and then you sell them three or four months later, and you usually have a commitment. That's a great opportunity to borrow because you are borrowing against a very, very clear income against that debt. But that's a specific circumstance. So my basic, my basic rule of thumb is I prefer doing equity at the beginning rather than doing debt. And I, if I do debt, I do as little as possible only because I do not want, I have enough things to worry about. Yeah. Worrying about having to pay back debt is different. One last quick thing, and this is getting a little geeky. Uh, Technically, most uh, equity these days for an early stage startup is raised as a convertible note, which is debt, but not really, because the expectation of the person who gives you the money is not they're going to pay them back. The expectation is that you're going to convert that debt into equity at some point reasonably near in the future. I count that as equity, even though technically it's debt. And I assume that wasn't the question you were asking. Great. Well, uh, we got an aloha from uh, from Jody Endicott, who says, Mark, OK, fine. No business plan. So please elaborate. She didn't say that. I, I added that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so she says, please elaborate on how to find funding or sponsorship if you don't have a business plan to show potential investors. Uh I believe that you can't raise money on a dream anymore. Uh, and you could take your dream and dress it up onto a 26 page, uh, one and a half spaced uh, business plan that says, here's what you're going to do in great detail. But it's just as flimsy as you going in and saying, here's what I'm going to do in not very much detail. In other words, if you want to raise money, raise funding or raise sponsorship, don't just talk about it. Demonstrate that the thing you want to do is real. Go out and figure out some quick, cheap, and easy way to prove it. it does not need to be repeatable. It does not need to be scalable. I just don't want to hear your hand waving and your dreaming. And a business plan is just a fancy way to wave your hands and dream. What I want you to do is come in and go, I've been doing this now using rubber bands and paper clips um, and after work and part-time and for six months. 
And I've pretty much proven that this thing that I believe is true is true. And here's why. Here's people who are paying me for it. Here's people who are renewing their subscription. Here's people who are telling their, it's not, I can't do it anymore because I'm doing it in a totally non-repeatable, non-scalable way. That's how you get funding and get sponsorship, not by talking about it. The All right. You got it, Jody? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> there you go. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Um, all right. So here's, here's an interesting one, uh, from, um, Europe, Karen, uh, Megan, sorry if I'm saying that out of order, but, um, she's impressed with you, Mark. I think a lot of us are oh, short, you. uh, long story short, she wants to work for you. Um, oh. so, uh, <laughs> are you going to give her a job on the spot? But I guess the bigger question is, um, what is your advice for people who are kind of looking to, get into something bigger, get, uh, work with someone that they really admire. Like how, how do you get your foot in the door in, in a, in a new place? Well, spare my inbox, but you ask. Um, uh, and it's such a classic case of it. Uh, it's a numbers game. Um, you would be amazed how many people are willing to give you a shot at something, but that comes from familiarity. Uh, and it's a numbers game, like I said. So let's take a couple of examples. Um, so my son, when he was still in college, um, wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I said, no, I didn't deny it, but I strongly advised against just wanting to become an entrepreneur. I go spend a, do a summer working as an internship in San Francisco. We'll find a startup for you to work at where you can see what this is like. And he did that. But what he really did was networked the networked himself to death. And basically he set this goal that he wanted to do coffee with someone four days out of the five days of the week. And he just began emailing people saying, Hey, I'm in San Francisco for the summer. I'm really interested in this. Would you have coffee with me? And, and so we can, I can learn some more about what you're up to. And he was doing this with startup CEOs and was really amazing. You know, of every hundred people he emailed, um, maybe 20 would respond and maybe three or four would say yes. And you might go, well, that's a pretty low hit rate, but it's not. You get three or four people who will sit down and have coffee with a college student. I think that's an amazing response. And that's what it takes. And at a simpler level, let's say you're not in a place where you're in San Francisco where you can go find people to have coffee with you. Engage with them in social media where they are. I promise I read my comments uh, on TikTok. I try and answer every comment on LinkedIn. I try and answer comments and I read them. And so if you're engaging there and you're intelligent and you're asking good questions, you're having interesting observations. And I see that name coming up over and over and over again. And then I get an email from that person. Believe me, it stands out. So are you going to get a job by the first time I've ever heard from you sending me a long email? Well, I do answer all my email, but it's going to be a very, very polite. I'm sorry. I don't have time. So you've got to set the groundwork first. And, and the first request should not be, can I work for you? The first one should be, I'm curious about something, or could you help me with something or something that's an easier? Yes. And I promise you accumulate every hundred asks you accumulate 20 maybes and of every 20 maybes you accumulate two let's talk and you accumulate one okay let's do it huh that that's all you need right uh that that's that's awesome i love that nothing is easy but if you're not willing to put in the work that's a, that's a sign that you but i don't want you to work for me either um we we had a question that was submitted from rich davidson uh who um you know it's, this is it, it's in regards to reaching out to people but uh, he's looking to connect with an investor that's not just, you know, a bank, but uh, someone who has experience and can provide guidance. Um, do you have any advice for, you know, cold reaching out and like knowing who might be that person and who isn't? Well, first of all, there is a million people like that. I mean, I think virtually every single person who has had some kind of successful outcome uh, as a startup does angel investing. I've met very, very few people 
who have not had that success, who don't want to pay it back or find it's a great way to stay connected and engaged. And those are amazingly good people to raise money from. Uh, you're not going to fill your whole round with it, um, but you're going to bring someone into your orbit who wants to hear what you're doing, who wants to hear your request for help, who wants to lean in and engage with you. It's exactly what you're looking for. But it's not like you just go in and put, and you, you have to work at it the same way that the person in the previous question has to work at it. Um, and do your research. If you aren't reading all the places people post, if you aren't looking at their blogs, if you aren't following these people on Twitter, you've got to understand whether you're in their wheelhouse or not. It is ridiculous for you to try and raise money for a startup doing something in whatever, for, a, pardon me, a social venture doing someplace from an entrepreneur, from a, a investor who only does, uh, you know, SaaS, uh, AI stuff. But if you're doing AI stuff, don't try and pitch it to someone who specializes in robotics. Do the research. Because if you find the person who genuinely interested in what you're doing, that's the best possible way that you're going to get a positive response. But again, it's not uh, easy. You just have to play the numbers. But there's so many people out there, there's no reason why. If you have a reasonable idea and you work hard at it, you can't find someone to back your business. That's great. Mark, uh, this is not so much a question, just a comment I thought you'd like to know from Richard Noren. He says, you come across as a highly likable person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to, how to respond to that. Um, I, I hope so. I have resting smile face. So it's, it's like... <laughs> I like that you come across. We're not sure that you are likable, but you come across. <laughs> oh, as, as okay, like. <laughs> I'll take that. You know, listen. In all sincerity, I have no idea really why that is. But one thing, and this is very, very true. I don't. I try so hard not to be full of myself. I so much believe that success that I've had, so much of it is luck. So much of it was being in the right place at the right time that for me to believe that I'm somehow special or different than all the people who are listening, it would be the worst act of hubris ever. Um, and I think uh, it gives me an empathy too for the people who I who are struggling with all the same stuff that I've had to struggle with too over the years. And it's why I love helping people so much with those things. Uh, that's great. And uh, you are uh, much appreciated in this chat. And I can confirm, having spent some time with Mark Randolph, he is actually a likable, uh, <laughs> great guy. So well, thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and I love to see people are inviting each other out for uh, virtual coffees in the chat. So that's awesome. I love people. Uh, people yeah. Being right on it. That's that's excellent. Um, let's see. We got uh, we're, we're starting to get towards the end here. But a couple more questions. Um, this is a question from Nick Curry, um, and it's your advice for future disruptors. You know, when you started Netflix, it didn't exist. So how do you, like, explain that to someone? They have to have some kind of vision to understand this thing that doesn't actually exist yet. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and the th Netflix is different, uh, and not because it's a different idea, but it's because of oh, it happened 25 years ago. And 25 years ago, it was extremely hard to prove things in advance because the infrastructure wasn't there. The support wasn't there. The tools weren't there. It took, took us, like as I mentioned at the beginning of our live stream here, you know, six months and a million dollars just to have a stupid website. But now you uh, don't have that excuse. If you have a good idea, there's no reason why you can't quickly, cheaply, and easily validate it in some way so that when you do present it to someone, you have some evidence um, that it actually works. Um, that is the way, that's the advice for someone who's a future disruptor is prove it. Um, if you have this great idea, which is gonna completely change the world, just talking about it isn't enough anymore. And I'll be the first to say, I kind of roll my eyes uh, at that. When I get the emails from people saying, this is guaranteed to be a hundred billion dollar. I go, how do you know? The only way you know is if you start and you stumble onto something. And just so if you have this great idea to change the world, figure out some quick and cheap and easy way to 
take the first step and see what you find out and then show me uh i i know the answer to this but how do you feel about people telling you this is a 12 billion dollar industry and if we get, <laughs> get like 0.001 percent of that we'll be making this much money what do you think about oh, I, that? it's a classic i love that one <laughs> it's also that it's it's right up there with the the hockey stick you know where after yeah. <laughs> a few years of struggling boom all of a sudden you hit yeah um but uh, Danny might surprise you. There's a little bit of truth in that. Uh, I do. I agree. I hate hearing the all we need is one percent of this, and we um, because that, that, that's it's still pretty damn hard. Uh, however, there is a factor about not being scared to go after big opportunities like that, because for example, I talk about it. I mean, Salesforce. You know, it's like a hundred billion dollar business. So. 1%, you know, or, or not 100 billion, but whatever the number is, but even a 1% is could be a $100 million opportunity. And they're not going to defend their least um, important $100 million piece of the business. Uh, and so even though someone else is doing it, that 1% of their total revenue is a big number to you. And it might be worth going after. So there's a little bit lamer answer. <laughs> Um, so let's see, we got maybe, maybe two more here. Uh, uh, Fulma brings up the, uh, you, you mentioned AI. Now, uh, we just saw in the news that chat GPT can now hear and speak in real time. So I guess not, uh, Fulma's question, but my question, is it over for humanity, Mark? Are we <laughs> done? Uh, so Dan, I'm an optimist. And an optimist is not someone who has this Pollyanna belief that everything is going to go well. What an optimist believes is that we don't know what's going to happen. Some good things are going to happen and some bad things are going to happen, but eventually we're going to figure it out. Uh, and I'm extremely excited about the opportunities that AI presents. Uh, are there going to be problems? Absolutely. Is it going to disrupt a lot of how we work and, or will people lose their jobs? Will we have to do things differently? Absolutely. Um, but we're going to figure it out. We are, it's, this is not going to be something which destroys um, humanity. I mean, th and this is going to sound trite, but every major technological advance that humans have made has threatened a lot of people. Uh, the steam engine, you know, or uh, the, the, assembly line, the internet. Um, these were huge changes in the way we did things and it resorts out who winners and losers are. But overall, these all tend to advance um, what it's like to be alive today. And I think AI is going to be no different. All right. Uh, I'm going to hold you to that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist, Dan. I love it. We'll figure it out. Um, so I think we'll end on one last question. Uh, right. This was sent from uh, Lorenzo Dennis, or possibly Dennis Lorenzo. I'm sorry if I mixed your name up, but um, sort of bringing it back down. Um, he is uh, someone who's been making music for 20 years, uh, and he kind of wants to turn this into his thing that he earns his money from. So do you have any advice for someone, whether it's music, someone who's trying to turn their passion for the arts or something else into a full-time job? Uh, the quick answer is, I don't know. I mean, I'll be quite honest about it. Um, because the category you've picked is a very, very difficult one to make um, money into it. I was just, I just was in uh, Nashville uh, at, for Americana Fest, which is kind of a singer songwriter music festival. And oh my God, unbelievably talented people. And you're struck though that for most of them, this is just a middle-class job. Uh, very few of them are getting rich and famous, but they're doing it because they love it. Uh, and I think setting your aspirations for that is a wonderful one. Um, and I'll just say that the answer to that is not asking me, who's a tech, a tech entrepreneur. It's going and looking at how all these people who manage to make a living at music manage to do it. Uh, you know, merch, social media, uh, I don't know, but I know a lot of people seem to be able to uh, to do it.
but I know that it's, uh, it's not easy, but I still wish you the best of luck. And if you're enjoying what you're doing, you're pretty much winning already. That's great. That's great. And one more pressing question. This will be quick from uh, Andre Savix, 14 years old. He asks, have you fixed your old Volvo? <laughs> As a matter of fact, we still have the Volvo. It is a spare car because it's no longer reliable enough that I certainly want to jump into it when I have to get someplace and trust that it will start. <laughs> but, uh, it is still being driven around. Um, I don't think it has a vanity plate, so I'd say keep an eye out for it. But okay. No. <laughs> Does it? Do you have it like bouncing? Is it? Um... <laughs> it's the one with the huge subwoofers. Yeah, yeah, that's no, great. It's, it's pretty nondescript as, as far as old Volvos go. But yes, it's well, still going. It's a. It's and eventually I'll be showing photos of it the same way we showed the old the photos today of the old mem memorabilia from the Netflix days. That's great. Well, Andre is, I think he's going to reach out. He said he has some follow-up questions for you if the answer was great. yes. So look out for those. Um, so I want to thank everyone who uh, joined in. We had a lot of great uh, questions in the chat and I really love to see people connecting here. Uh, really cool. You bring people together, Mark. That's awesome. Oh, oh shucks. Um, so want to remind people where they can follow you. How can they get more, more Mark in their lives? So two things. One is ground zero for me is my website, which is markrandolph.com. And there, besides you'll finding all of my little social media handles so that you can follow me on TikTok, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. Um, also can find my blog posts there where I talk about a lot of the stuff in more depth than what I talked about here. You'll find links to my book. Uh, there it is. No, nope, over here. Uh, this, all right. There it, it is. Right there. there it is. Uh, my book. Uh, and You'll also find a way to apply to join uh, Neverland, which is the entrepreneurial community I run, where we talk about, what a surprise, entrepreneurship. And it's a great place to connect with other entrepreneurs, almost as good as connecting in the comments here on the Entrepreneur live stream. That's awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Before to sh Be sure to follow Mark. And on that website, that's the place where you'll be able to submit questions for the next one. Uh, also follow entrepreneur on social media. We take questions there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, hope your Volvo, you know, goes another a hundred thousand miles. As do I, as do I. <laughs> well, thanks Dan. And thanks everybody for joining us today. We'll see you again soon. See you soon.